right, thanks for the intro. I'm really excited to be here and be able to share some of the things that we've been working on through the summer. So the goal of our research was to design a metric that can quantify how creative soccer players are. And Seth already gave it away during his intro. We found that Kevin De Bruyne is the most creative player, or at least that he was the most creative player during the previous Premier League season. And I have to admit that I was very pleased to see De Bruyne pop up at the top of our ranking because as a Belgian, I'm obviously a huge fan of De Bruyne. But more importantly, because he's the player that we, are, that we already had in mind while writing the proposal for this research. So we think that De Bruyne is a great example of a creative player that sees the passing options that other players often don't see. Hence, I think that De Bruyne deserves his spot at the top of our ranking. But I'm wondering who else do you think should be in this list? Does anyone have a suggestion? Maybe just shout a couple of names. Yeah, that's a good one. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, not a good one. So I've already heard a couple of names of players that are indeed quite high in our ranking, but I'll only reveal the results at the end of this talk. Because the point that I wanted to make here is that everyone here intuitively knows what creativity means in soccer and can probably name a few players. And that is because creativity is something that's often discussed among fans and in the media. For example, here, Ryan O'Hanlon wrote his article for ESPN explaining why he thinks that Trent Alexander-Arnold is the most creative player. And it's not only fans, also clubs and analysts consider creativity to be a valuable trait and hence look for it while scouting for players. So we've established here that creativity is valued by all the stakeholders in soccer. And being such a valuable attribute of players, it would only make sense if it would be something quantifiable. But surprisingly enough, there are no real metrics that really capture creativity. And that's the gap that we're trying to fill here. Now, if you want to measure something with numbers, the first thing you need is a good definition of what you want to measure. And in psychology, creativity is often defined as the ability to produce work that is both novel and appropriate. However, in the context of soccer, I prefer to use the terms like um, unexpected or original instead of novel and useful instead of appropriate. So this means that being creative goes beyond just doing something useful to do something useful in a unique or a typical way. And that's something that's not captured by the existing metrics that are often linked with creativity, like for example, the number of assists and the number of key passes because they simply measure whether a player does something useful, but not whether he does it in a unique or original way. Now, we wanted to apply this definition to measure the creativity of passes. And then our intuition was that a player performs a creative pass if it differs from the typical pass that most players would have selected in the game state, so when it's original, and B, when it has more promising results than this typical choice. To illustrate this intuition, I selected a few examples from a game between Liverpool and Man City last season. The first example is one of a pass which I would consider a creative one. It starts with De Bruyne picking up the ball inside, in, inside his own half and running past Liverpool's midfield. Then, I believe the only player in De Bruyne's eye line, or the only City player, is Phil Foden in the centre. But somehow, De Bruyne manages to spot Magres, who is breaking forward on the right, and uh, puts him through with a bending pass. And this pass takes both of our boxes, so it's definitely original and different from the pass that most players would have played in that game state, and it is useful because it puts Magres in front of goal. Then the second example is actually quite similar. Again, it starts with De Bruyne running past Liverpool's midfield and then playing a true ball, this time to Jesus. And despite that it's very similar, I don't think that this one is creative. It's still useful because it puts Jesus in front of goal, but it's not very original because I think that most players would have played the same pass in this game state. It's just a straightforward, true ball. Um, then the third example is a pass between, I believe, Cancelo and Sterling. And I would say that this one is creative again. But the issue is that it doesn't take both of our boxes. It is original, but it doesn't seem useful because Liverpool intercepts the ball here. So I have to make a side note about uh, what I mean by being useful. Um, so I think creative passes don't necessarily have to be successful because um, creativity concerns 
the conception of a path rather than the execution. So this means that we need to abstract away from the actual result of the path to measure creativity. So to summarize, we have to capture three aspects to measure creativity. First, creative paths should be useful, but we need to abstract away from the actual result of the path. And third, they should be original, which means that we should consider how the chosen path relates to the other options that the game state afforded. I'll start with the requirement that creative paths should be useful, since this is probably what most people are already familiar with. After all, this is what frameworks like expected threat, FAPE, OBV attempt to measure. At a high level, they all measure the usefulness of actions according to this equation. So the idea is to measure the change in quality of game state between the pre-action game state and the post-action game state. In the example part of the Brunner that I've shown before, the creative one, the pre-action game state is the moment in the game when the Brunner executes the pass, and the post-action game state is the moment in the game when my grass receives the ball. Then the quality Q of the game state is typically measured in terms of the probability of scoring or conceding a goal. In our example, the probability of scoring a goal is 2% in the post-action game state, and no, 2% in the pre-action game state, and 9% in the post-action game state, and combined that gives us a usefulness value of 0.07. So that's the standard approach of measuring the usefulness of actions, but remember, we want to make abstraction of the result of the action. And in mathematical terms, this corresponds to taking the expected value. And since a path can be either successful or fail, we compute this expected value as the weighted sum over both outcomes. Concretely, for example, to measure the expected quality of the post-action game state, we first uh, predict the probability that the path would be successful. Uh, we also uh, compute the quality of the game state conditioned on the fact that the path is successful then the probability that the pass fails, and finally also the quality of the game state conditioned on the fact that the pass fails. Then we combine this as a weighted sum, and this gives us the expected quality of the post-action game state. I've shown them here as probability surfaces, but obviously we only take the value at the location where the ball is in the post-action game state. Then the second dimension of creativity is originality. And therefore, we should consider how the chosen path relates to the other options that the game state afforded. Um, more specifically, we should determine whether the selected path is different from the typical path that most players would have selected in that game state. So we first estimate the probability or the likelihood of a path being made towards, towards all other locations on the pitch. And that's what you can show, that's what you can see here. So, um, Dark red colors represent more likely passes, and what you see is that the most likely pass in our example is a pass to Phil Foden, who was in the center of the pitch. Then the challenging part is how you define a typical pass. You could define it as a weighted average over the 5% most likely actions, the 10% most likely actions, and so on. But what we found is that it actually works well to simply take the single most likely pass as being the typical pass. Because especially in these high value game states that have a big impact on our metric, there's typically only one very obvious passing option that, that most players select. So then we can finally combine this and um, then I can show our creative decision rating. So the, so the creative decision rating of a pass A in a game state S is given by the difference between the expected usefulness of a player's passing decision and the expected usefulness of the passing decisions that most players would have made in that game state. So intuitively, a player gets a positive creative decision rating if he selects a pass that's, that's different from the typical pass, but has a higher expected usefulness. I have a few examples here. If a player plays the typical pass in blue, um, then obviously both terms are equal to each other, which gives a creative decision rating of zero. If a player selects a pass that's different from a typical pass, but which has a lower usefulness value, like a pass to the sideline over there, then he gets a negative creative decision rating. And for the Brunner's pass, which was different from a typical pass, but is probably more useful, we get a positive creative decision rating. So 
This creative decision rating abstracts the way from the result of the action, which means um, that, um, that it simply rewards players for attempting creative passes regardless of the outcome of that pass. Now, what we also want to measure is whether a player can actually execute his passes. So obviously, we have a second metric to address that. That's our execution rating, uh, which measures the technical execution quality of a pass as the difference between the observed outcome of the pass and the predicted success probability of the pass. So in the left term, we have a value of one if the pass is successful and zero otherwise. And in the right term, we have the probability that a player would successfully execute a pass given the context in which the pass is executed. Again, uh, for that easy pass to the sideline, which has a very high success probability of 93%, if a player successfully executes that pass, he gets a positive execution rating of 0.07. If he flubs that easy pass, then he gets a very negative execution rating of 0.93. We can also look at the Brunus pass, which is definitely harder and only has a success completion percentage of 41%. So for successfully executing that pass, the Brunus gets an execution rating of 0.59. So, now that we have a mathematical formulation of our metric, this brings us to the remaining task of estimating these three components that produce a single estimate of um, creativity when combined. First, we have pass selection. That's an, that's an estimate of the likelihood of a pass being made towards every other location on the pitch. Then, pass success, an estimate of the success probability of a pass towards every other location. And third, pass value, that's an estimate of the expected long-term reward following a successful or a failed pass towards every other location. If you're familiar with tracking data or research on tracking data, you've probably seen each of these surfaces before. The novelty here is that we have to estimate them from Statsbomb 360 data, which you could consider as a limited version of tracking data that lacks um, a full view of the pitch, um, the speed and direction in which players are moving, and the identities of players. But at a high level, the implementation of each of these components is actually very similar because for each of them, we can use a standard supervised machine learning pipeline where given some representation of the game state, we learn a machine learning model that yields a probability between zero and one for each location on the pitch. But let's start with the game state. Therefore, we extract all passes from the Statsbomb 360 data and we only include the passes for which both the start and the end location are visible in the 360 snapshot, such that we get the full context of these passes. Then, to get some context about what happened before that pass, we also include um, the, the two actions that lead up to the pass. Then, we have to learn these machine learning models that can produce these three probability surfaces from the game state, and therefore, we experimented with two classes of models. First, gradient boosting models with handcrafted features, and then deep learning models based on the soccer map architecture. I thought it would be interesting to experiment with two, these two classes of models because what you see is that in event data, uh, people typically use uh, gradient boosting models with handcrafted features, while the deep learning models work well on tracking data. So since we are working with this kind of hybrid data, I thought it would be interesting to compare how both classes of models uh, perform on our task of estimating these three probability surfaces. This is what a soccer map architecture looks like. It was proposed by Fernandez and Born. And I, would, I don't want to go into details here, but like very briefly, um, you can structure it in three parts, an input layer, a feature extraction block, and an output layer. The input layer consists of a tensor in which the channels represent low level spatiotemporal information. Then you have the feature extraction block, which consists of convolutional neural networks at different resolutions such that it can learn or capture information both at local and a global level. And then in the output layer, you simply uh, modify the, the activation function um, depending on which of the three surfaces you want to learn. Um, actually, the only part of the soccer map architecture that we adapted is the, the input layer. Uh, therefore, we use this game state representation which first includes a representation of the location of the ball relative to the location of the goal, both in terms of the distance and the angle 
Then we include the locations of the players, of the attacking team and the defending team. And finally, we have a few contextual features. Um, so the number of attackers that would be outplayed by a pass towards each other location, as well as the defenders. And then we have the speed of the ball, which we derive from the uh, two previous events in the event stream data. And that gives us some indication of the direction in which the ball is moving. So that's a very coarse representation of the game state, as opposed to our gradient boosting models with handcrafted features. I think overall we have worked with more than 50 features, so it would take a bit too long to go over all of them. But you could group them in, in four main groups. First, we have like a bunch of very simple features that are based on the information from a single action, and which you can often simply read from the event stream data. To give two examples, the pass height and the distance to goal. Then we have a few more complex features, which we derive from combining multiple events, like the verticality, which is the speed at which the ball is moving vertically. And then I think the most interesting features are the ones we compute from the 360 snapshots, such as the distance to the defender that is close to the player making the pass and the distance to each potential receiver. And then finally, we have a few contextual features like the current score line and the goal difference. And actually, the, the features that we use depend on the task that we want to uh, complete. Then. The paper contains a lot of experiments comparing the gradient boosting models and the soccer map architecture in different settings. I won't go over them because that would take too long, but the, the, the main conclusion is that feature engineering always outperformed deep learning. So we went with the gradient boosting models. Apart, uh, there's one um, exception, and that's in the path selection model, where we try to estimate the destination of a path because you can define the destination of a pass in two ways. You can define it as a pass to a specific player or as a pass to a specific location. And um, only the soccer map architecture can model the latter. Um, and, and actually, we wanted to model the um, a pass to a specific location because that allows us to distinguish between an easy pass to a player's current location and a true ball which a player should run into and which is often more creative. So that's better suited for the task we want to complete. And actually the difference, as you see, is never that big between the gradient boosting models and the deep learning models. Then I can finally re reveal the results. So these are the five players with the highest cumulative decision rating per 90 minutes. You already knew that the Bruyne ranks on top. But then at close distance, we have Terry Clemty, um, the wing back from Brighton and Hove Albion. And I have to admit that he was a surprise to me because he's a player that I don't really know. But then further down the list, we have players like Trent Alexander-Arnold, Rafinha, and Hakim Ziyech, which I believe make a lot of sense. Further down in the top 10, we have um, Lucas Mora, Harry Kane, Odegaard, Saka, and Mason Mount. So remember that we abstracted away from the actual result of the pass, which means that um, we simply reward players for attempting creative passes, regardless of the outcome or the result of the pass. And that's a good thing, because it allows us to do a fine-grained evaluation of a player's creative abilities, but it also omits an important aspect of a player's performance evaluation. So to see whether a player pairs a vision with the technical abilities to execute the pass that he envisions, We've also looked at the relation between the creative decision rating and the execution rating. So on the x-axis, I show the um, average creative decision rating per pass, which is different from what I've shown in the previous slide, which was normalized per 90 minutes. So that's why the ranking of players is slightly different here. And on the y-axis, you can see the average execution rating per pass. Now, in general, we didn't find any strong relationships between a player's creative abilities and technical abilities. What we mostly found is that um, the execution rating is mostly determined by a player's position, with especially um, defensive midfielders scoring quite high on the execution rating and attackers scoring rather low. I think that is mainly because um, the effects of losing ball possession are less detrimental for attackers than they are for defenders, so attackers can afford themselves a few more mistakes. But maybe one player that's an exception to that rule is Mason Mount, 
um, who has a quite high execution rating for mostly being an attacking midfielder, and he pairs that with a very high creative decision rating. Now, what's definitely a limitation of our approach is that it assigns all the credit for attempting creative passes to the player that executes the pass and doesn't give, give any credit to the player on the receiving end. Well, in reality, it's often the player on the receiving end that enables a pass by diving into a pocket of space. So to somewhat address this issue, we've also looked at the pairs of players that ex exhibit the highest creativity with mutual passes between them. And I very much liked the players that appear on top here. So first we have Mohamed Salah and Sadio Mane from Liverpool, and then Harry Kane and Hong Min Son from Tottenham. Um, both of these duos have been played together for many years, so they should be fully attuned to, to each other, and that probably helps with being creative. Also note that Kevin De Bruyne appears twice in this list again, once with Bernardo Silva and once with Phil Foden. Then I was also wondering at which positions the most creative players typically play, because um, creativity is most often linked with the role of a playmaker or number 10, who generally plays place from the position of a central attacking midfielder. So therefore, I've shown here the uh, average creative decision rating per position, with darker colors representing more creativity. And you can see that indeed the central attacking midfielder position scores quite high, but most creativity is actually coming from the wings. And that's maybe not such a big surprise, because it's something you see more and more that um, a team puts its main creative force on the wings. For example, Messi and Neymar operate from the wings. De Bruyne did as well in the past. Um, but what's actually very interesting here is the big imbalance between the right and the left wing, with, with the right wing being way more creative than the left wing. And I'm not sure why that is, and it would require some more research to see whether that generalizes to other leagues, but it might just have something to do with the current player selection in the Premier League. And I have one more interesting observation. Um, we've also looked at how the creativity changes as the game progresses. So this is the creative decision rating uh, grouped by blocks of 15 minutes. What you can see is that the average creative decision rating doesn't really change a lot, but what does change a lot is the variance in creative decision rating. We think this is because uh, as time progresses, players get fatigued and more space opens up. So that enables players to be more creative because there's more space to play the ball into. But they might also miss a few more opportunities due to fatigue and just like trying to defend more and, and avoiding risk. And actually, I first thought that this would have something to do with one team getting on the lead and another team getting behind which means that one team has to be more creative to score goals and um, close the gap. But that seems not the case. What we see here is that, um, again, there's not a big change in the, in the mean creativity, but um, the variance increases as soon as one team scores a goal. So it's probably the same story again. As soon as a goal is scored, more, place, more space opens up. Then to wrap up, these are the three things you should remember from my talk first. I've argued that being creative entails doing something useful, but in a unique or atypical way. And that's something that's not measured by the existing metrics that are often linked with creativity, like number of assists and number of key passes, which only measure whether a player does something useful, but not whether he does it in a unique or atypical way. Then we proposed a novel metric that uh, quantifies creativity by combining three machine learning models. First, a pass selection model that predicts the likelihood of a pass being made towards every other location and hence captures originality. Then, a pass value model which captures usefulness of a pass. And finally, a pass success model which predicts the, like, no, which predicts the probability that the pass would be successful and which we use to distinguish between the um, conception of a pass and the technical execution quality of a pass. Then, with respect to its applications, I, um, our metric allows comparing players on their creative abilities, both in general as well in more specific contexts. Um, for example, near the end of a game when the pressure might be higher and, um, which, and such that players might be more or less um, creative, uh, 
and this can provide valuable information to scouts and clubs during the scouting process. But altogether, I think this research is a valuable first step towards capturing the complex notion of creativity in soccer. And that's the end of my talk. Um, there are a lot more details in the research paper, which you can find by scanning the QR code or on the Stansmob website. And both me and Jesse are here to discuss further. And I would be happy to answer any questions. Thanks for the talk. Um, is there a difference in player creativity in regards of the playing position? So if the player is playing right wing or left wing, is there a difference in creativity? Um, not sure whether I get what you mean, but like what we found is that in the previous Premier League season, that players on the right wing were in general way more creative than players on the left wing. Yeah, of course that was uh, that was what you presented. Yeah. But if that's if if the player is switching the position in game from the left side or the right side, does that um, change his creativity? That's something I haven't looked at, so okay. I can't answer it. If you've done anything to sort of see about decoupling creativity from team quality, obviously there's a, there's part of the reason Manchester City is good is because they mm. have Kevin. But what would happen to his creativity if you dropped him on, onto a team, the bottom end of the table? Has, is is that sort of a, a a future application, or have you had a chance to yeah, look into that at all? That's definitely I have thought about because what we see is that most players that are on top are players from. Um, from Tottenham, Manchester City, and Liverpool, which is probably partly because they create way more opportunities than other teams. Um, but yeah, I didn't have the time to really look at the impact of team quality on creativity. Thanks for the talk. Um, just a quick question. Do you have any thoughts on why um, Soccer Map didn't do as well, or are there any obvious improvements you think we should make to Soccer Map to make it work better? Yeah, so what would help the soccer map approach a lot is um, having information about the speed and direction in which players are moving. Um, but that's something you don't have in the Stasbom 360 snapshots, and which we try to address a bit by including the speed of the ball, which we get from the event stream data. Um, but it would be interesting to compare um, how the XG boost with handcrafted features compares with soccer map on the fault tracking data. Um, Yeah, and, and like one thing which is like a weakness of soccer map that I've experienced is that it often like doesn't detect well whether a passing lane is blocked. So um, I think including that in the game state representation might as well improve the soccer map approach a bit. Hi, Radoslav Marcinkowski, Respovision. I want to ask also, ask also about this uh, map of... Uh creativity, if, the, for example, Hurricane is playing as a striker forward, but he's done something, I don't know how, some creative pass in the middle of the field as he used to do, he's used to do it, does it mean that he was uh, assigned to him as a striker, or is it like the, posi the position on the field was on the map was like on the basi based on the position on the field where the action takes place? Uh, we use his starting position. Yeah, the starting position as annotated in the stats bomb data. So, for example, if the right winger would go to the left and do something creative, it would still be uh, as, as a right winger. Right yeah, indeed. 